Amen. So, what I'm saying here is that that in the Millerite history, the development of truth in the Millerite history can be portrayed as an increase of knowledge if you're looking at Daniel 12, but if you look at Revelation 5 and onward, it's, it's that increase of knowledge is represented by the removal of seven seals. And the final seal for the Millerite history was the midnight cry message of Samuel Snow. And Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. Samuel Snow's message brought to perfection the judgment hour message. The first seal was William Miller understanding the judgment hour message. Uh, but the Lord held his hand over a component of that when his hand was removed after 1843 went into history. Uh, the Lord used Samuel Snow to perfect that message. That was the removing of the seventh seal. And the message of the seventh seal reached its climax when the door closed. And we're saying that the Millerite history illustrates our history to the very letter and that the light that was opened up in 1989 at our time in the end was the last six verses of Daniel 11 and I'm claiming that the part of Daniel 11 that we understood at that time period that the Lord held his hand over was that the Soviet Union was the king of the south but the capital of the Soviet Union the head of the Soviet Union was Russia and though the Soviet bloc countries were swept away and brought most of them back under the influence of Rome, um, that the King of the South was still sitting there, sleeping, waiting to make an attack uh, that is the attack here of uh, the Battle of Raffia. And I mentioned last night, um, I'll mention it again because it seems significant to me, in your notes, beginning on the, towards the end of your notes, you don't have to necessarily look there, but on page 20 and 21, this is from history. You will see the history of the Syrian wars, and there were six Syrian wars. Okay, so I'm believing that those that this is another line of history to uphold what we're teaching, based upon the the idea that the first Syrian war is this one right here. That is verse five. Okay, when when uh, Seleucus um, consolidates his power, conquering that third entity. That is the second Syrian war. Um, here in 246, um, in verses 6 through 9, the battle in 246 is the third Syrian war. And then verses 11, the battle of Raphia. I'm skipping over 1989. It's not part of the Syrian wars. The battle of Raphia is the fourth Syrian war and then the battle that we would look at next is the battle of Panium that's the fifth Syrian war so out of those six Syrian wars at least four of those wars are marked in Daniel 11 and the pioneers that put together the understanding of the history represented by Daniel 11 they they point to those very same wars so um, it's at least of interest that the proxy war that's going on between the United States and Russia right now is going on in Syria, <coughs> where all of this history of Daniel 11 takes place, is in Syria. Um, so, uh, in Daniel 11, we now want to look at, at the Battle of Paneum, and this to me is the, the anchor this particular battle, it, it does many things beyond simply confirming the last six verses of Daniel 11. It also introduces us to the Omega apostasy. I don't know how much we'll get into that today, but um, it's pretty incredible what, what the Battle of Panium does in terms of showing the sequence of Daniel 11 as typifying the understanding of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, it opens the idea of the Omega apostasy. And uh, you can tell that there's so much light still left in Paneum that we haven't recognized. It's just amazing. So in verse 13, the, the bottle of Rafi has taken place. And I'm saying, 
that uh, the, the Battle of Raffia is midnight. I'm saying that there's a sign there. There's an enemy that's putting its end signs in the sanctuary, okay? That, that's from the Battle of Raffium. Raffia, and uh, that immediately in the history, immediately after the battle, there is a peace treaty that's entered into, and okay, we'll deal with that a little bit more as we proceed. Verse 13 is the retaliation of the king of the north against the king of the south, it's the retaliation of the United States against Russia. It says, For the king of the north shall return and set forth a multitude greater than the former. What I want you to see here, because we'll deal with it a little bit more. That's not very straight, is it, this, this line? Okay. The, uh, this being the Battle of Raffia, when it says that the king of the north is going to return, the king of the north of the United States has just been defeated, okay? So he's going to set forth another, a, a great multitude, it says here in verse 13. Because you're going to begin to get testimony that in here, there's a buildup of military strength that's going on in the United States. Okay, now what that does, if you're willing to consider it, it's saying that there is going to be, that you should expect some kind of economic prosperity in the, the presidency of Trump leading up to midnight and then even after midnight because when a country starts building up its military complex it causes the economy to go up okay so there's going to be there's going to be a time of prosperity in here or at least harsh some kind of prosperity it's being built up I'm noting that in verse 13 because there's other lines we're going to get to that teach that very same thing okay um, he shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with a great army and much riches. See, when he comes here at Paneum, he's coming with a great army and what else? Much riches. So there's, there's some kind of economic development going on in here, even though the United States somehow gets defeated here. All right? And I, I'm saying somehow... What I'm certain of for myself is that it's, it's such a dramatic nature that it's been typified by the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 and it's been typified by uh, the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan in uh, the end of World War II. And I'm sure that those are the two histories of the 20th century that historians say are the most significant histories of the 20th century. And they turned history a totally different direction in both cases. Whatever this is at midnight, whatever defeat it is that Russia gives to the United States, it'll be that significant. But there'll be a peace treaty. If the history of Rafia is correct, you go into the history, and you need to go into the history and check it out, not just take it from me, you'll see that while the war was pretty much still going on, they, they enter into a peace treaty right here. So bring it to a conclusion very quick. And now there's a buildup going on here. Uh, much great army and much riches. That also is the characteristics of the United States. Military strength and economic strength. That's the, the two strengths that you'll find in Daniel 11 verse 40 represented by ships and chariots and horsemen. Okay, in those times, in these times here, the papacy is going to come into the mix. Okay, if you know the story of, uh, of Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mark, Mount Carmel, Jezebel's back in Samaria. She's not, she's not in full view. So the papacy's been pulling the strings for the United States since the early 1980s, at least. And it's been behind the scenes. But here, evidently, this defeat of the United States is of such a nature that the papacy begins to get into the... Uh, I mean, we still, as Adventists, we watch what the Pope is doing. Okay, but most of the world doesn't think anything one way or another about what the Pope's doing. They just they think it's news. Something here, uh, in these times, the Pope of Rome, the papacy, is going to get involved in the world affairs in a more dramatic fashion. Okay, And in those times, there shall stand up many against the king of the south. So um, I'm arguing that 
right here at the Battle of Paneum that this is the midnight cry. And that here, based upon where we began last night, in Daniel 10, verse 20. Let me check that. Yes. That Gabriel told Daniel at the midnight cry that he's going forth to struggle with the prince of Persia. He's going to forth to struggle with the United States. And when he's gone forth, the prince of Grecia will come. So you, I'm marking the, the Medes and the Persians are the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. That's the United States. So right here at the midnight cry, Gabriel's going to struggle with the United States. And as soon as he goes to struggle with the United States, the seventh kingdom of Bible prophecy arrives. What I'm saying is that this is where you're noting the United Nations. Okay. Now, let me give you a secondary argument that's outside these verses. Maybe a little bit confusing at first. Probably shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, all right? This, this here is the French Revolution. In the, this line is going to be the French Revolution. And in 1789, you have the Constitution of the United States introduced, and the first President of the United States, George Washington, who's actually this. 17th president of the United States. George Washington comes here in 1789. But you also have a constitution in France called the Rights of Man. It's primarily written by Lafayette. And he gets his information prim primarily from Thomas Jefferson who wrote this constitution. So you have two witnesses here of the constitution going on. And then in 1793, you have the Reign of Terror. And in Great Controversy, Sister White tells us that in 1793, the French Assembly outlawed the Bible, okay? So what you have with that is you, you have Sister White connecting 1793 with Revelation 11, when the two witnesses are cast into the street for three and a half years. This begins right here in 1793. Okay, so what happened in 1793, among other things, is that the, the communists, they took King Louis XVI and they chopped his head off right here. And in Great Controversy, Sister White says, the spot where he lost his head was the identical spot where the first Protestant reformer in France lost his head. And he lost his head, the first Protestant reformer, on the same day in the same month, 258 years earlier. Okay, and if that's all in the Great Controversy. And this was... Uh, July 21st, okay, the 21st is associated with midnight. If you remember that at 9-11, you can put Daniel, and he's fasting for 21 days, okay? So the, I, that ain't, that's, I shouldn't even get into that, but it's just some of the things that come up. But 258 years earlier, on did I say July 21st? Yes. I meant January 21st. Okay. Oh, you wrote, you wrote no, 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 check it out. Uh, I, I, now I'm uncertain what month it is, but I know it's the same. Okay, it's, I'm, I'm uncertain now whether it's the January or July, but it's the 21st. Someone needs to check that out in the Great Controversy. Yes, Type in 1793 in the Great yes. Controversy. January. January 21st, okay. So on January 21st in 1535, the very first Protestant reformer in France is slain on that day. 258 years later, exactly, King Louis XVI loses his head at the same spot in France. Wow. Okay. And this is in the Great Controversy, so it makes it a prophetic waymark. It's, it's something that is marked by inspiration. But what happens here is a king, a kingdom's removed. Kingdom removed, right? Because the king just lost his head. And this is part of the, the French Revolution. They're, they're rebelling against royalty, the king, and corrupt religion, the papacy. Okay, so here a kingdom is removed. And you have the king of the south arrive in history for the first time. The king of communism. Is, this is the first time the king of the south 
as the king of communism arrives in history. Of course, we want to know that because we're looking at the king of the south here in Daniel 11 in our day and age. But what this is, the king of the south, the king of communism, it's a dragon power. It's not a false prophet. It's not the beast. The king of the south, communism, Egypt, it's a dragon power. So this is a new manifestation. This is manifestation, I'm abbreviating it, of of satanic power. And, and you, you, Sister White actually uses that expression once about the dragon power, a new manifestation of the dragon power. Okay, so, so that's supposed to be an R. Okay, there's other characteristics that you can put with that. So what am I doing here? Here's what I'm doing here. This is the beginning of the King of the South. <clears throat> I'm arguing that at the Battle of Paneum, it's the end of the King of the South. That Russia is the King of the South, it's the King of Communism, and therefore, Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning. Mm -hmm. So if this is correct, if this is the end of the King of the South, the King of Communism of Russia, then you will have to see a new manifestation of the dragon power. That's the seventh kingdom. It's the United Nations. Okay, you're going to have to see a kingdom removed. That's Russia. And you're going to see persecution begin here. Persecution. Because this is the persecution of the Protestant Reformation. So I want you to see, when you get into the French Revolution, you have a secondary witness that Russia is removed from history here because it's the King of the South. This is the end of the King of the South. 1793 is the beginning of the King of the South. And Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. You following the logic there? What's, what's the kingdom that will be removed uh, at midnight? Not midnight cry, but midnight. Oh, at midnight. Yeah. Because it's... With oh, you're saying because this will be a fractal of this? Yeah. Well, you're marking it at midnight, so I'm just... Yeah, I, yeah, yeah you, I probably shouldn't have did that because it just confused things. So are you lining up at midnight cry? Right? Yeah, I'm, I'm lining I'm making the argument. I'm trying to give a secondary witness that Russia comes to an end here because Russia is the king of the south. And in the beginning of the King of the South, in here, you have these characteristics that should be reflected in the end of the King of the South. And I'm saying that Paneum is the end of Russia and that this history will square with that. Um, and some of you were here last night. I argued last night, not argued, but I made the point last night the first insurrection of the French Revolution was in Grenoble. Okay, it's called, in the French history books, it's called the Insurrection of Grenoble. And it started in 1788, or it happened in 1788. So I'm arguing that if you go 10 years into the future, it brings you to 1798. So you have a number 10 that, that covers this history. Because last night we talked about the number 10 and 7 and 3 in the beginning and ending of the United States. Remember you have 7 presidents followed by 10 presidents. Okay, and at the end you have a, the 45th president that turns into the 10 kings that turns into the 7. Okay, so in the French Revolution, France changes everything. It makes its own calendar. Okay, a calendar of 10 days for one week. 10 months in a year, and it, it gets, it's really a kind of a crazy calendar. But they started it in 1792. And it went for 14 of their French years. But the first seven of those years take place, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. So in this history here, you have both a 10 and a 7. Okay, so this 10-7 thing is 
very significant. You can show 10 steps in here, and you can break those 10 steps out into three and seven, just in this binding off period. And if you can show a 10 and a three and a seven in the binding off of the priest, then you can show a 10 and a three to seven in the binding off of the Levites, and you can show a 10 and a three and a seven in the binding off of the 11th hour workers. So this 10, seven, three combination, combination that we began discussing last night, it's pretty profound and what it's, what it's saying to us. Okay, so back to Pneum. Um, verse 15. So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mountain, and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand, neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any, be any strength to withstand. That's the end of Russia as the king of the south. And as my brother was asking about the sequence of events, if I'm saying verse 16 is the Sunday law in the United States, what I'm saying also is that verse 17 is... What I'm saying is verse 16 now, if you move into verse 16, that's verse 41 of Daniel 11. If you ver move into 17, 18, and 19, that is verses 42 to 45. Okay, because after the glorious land is conquered in Daniel 11 verse 41, then it's going to conquer Egypt in verse 42 and 43. And then in verse 44, tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him, and he shall go forth to destroy and utterly make away many. But in verse 45, he's going to come to his end between the seas and the glorious holy mountain with none to help him. So in verse 17, this is Julius Caesar. And this is Julius Caesar conquering Egypt, the third obstacle in 47 BC. And it says this, he's conquering Egypt right where verse 42 of Daniel 11 is. And that's Egypt being conquered. So Julius Caesar here is representing the papacy. Okay, we got some quotes in here where Sister White compares Julius Caesar with Alexander the Great. Okay, Alexander the Great establishes a, a, a world empire, and so did Julius Caesar. Alexander the Great established the Greek, in, Greek Empire, which is the point of reference for the whole story of the King of the North and the King of the South. But when Julius Caesar conquers Egypt here, now Alexander's domain is now Roman. It's no longer Greek, it's Roman. Both of them establish a new world order. Okay? And Sister White uses them to typify each other. We have a quote here to show that. So when we bring this to the end of the world, Julius Caesar at this point, he's not representing uh, George Bush II as a president. He's representing modern Rome, the papacy, taking control of the world. Okay, he's, in verse 16, he's just conquered the glorious land. Verse 17, he's going to conquer Egypt, and it says this. He shall set his face to enter with the strength of his whole kingdom. Okay, now, when a... When a he's, he's, all that's left for Julius Caesar now is Egypt, and he sets his face to enter Egypt. Okay, so go to Jeremiah 42. Because when someone sets their face to enter Egypt, it's, it's teaching us something. Jeremiah 42, verse 15. Jeremiah 42, verse 15 says, and now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, If you wholly set your faces, faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, and that's what Julius Caesar is doing in verse 17. That's also what Mark Anthony did. Okay. And if you set your face to enter into Egypt, verse 16 says, Then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you in the land of Egypt, and the famine whereof ye were afraid shall follow close after you there in Egypt, and there shall ye die. So shall it be with all the men that set their faces to go into Egypt to sojourn there. They shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence, and none of them shall remain or escape from the evil that I will bring upon them. So if you go back to Daniel 11, verse 17 now, 
Julius Caesar, he's going to die. Okay, that's the story of Julius Caesar. He goes in and conquers Egypt, then he comes back to Rome, and he's slain there by Brutus. But the same thing with Mark Antony. He goes into Egypt, he falls in love with Cleopatra, just like Julius Caesar did, and he dies at the Battle of Actium because they set their face to go into Egypt. But Julius Caesar is typifying modern Rome, the Pope of Rome. He's ready to conquer Egypt, verses 42 and 43. And in verse 45, he's going to come to his end with none to help. This is, this is the sign he's, he's about to get taken down. So verse 17 says, He shall set his face to enter with, strength, with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus shall he do. And I would argue that the upright ones with him here, in the story of Julius Caesar, it was the Jews that allowed the Roman soldiers to cross the land of Israel unmolested so they could get to Egypt and engage in the battle there. And they actually sent some troops with them. And Uriah Smith said, had they not done that, Julius Caesar could not have prevailed. So those upright ones are the participation of the Hebrews back in that history. I would say that verse 16, the so-called Protestants of the United States are the upright ones here with the Pope of Rome that he's marching with at this point. Um, the upright ones with him, thus shall he do. He shall give him the daughter of woman, corrupting her. This is Cleopatra. And uh, what does Cleopatra mean? The glory of the Father, whatever that might mean corrupting her, but she shall not stand on his side, neither before him. After this he shall he turn his face unto the isles, and shall take many. But a prince, what's a prince in Daniel 11? It's Sar. It's a military leader. Yes? Check it out, it is. Every time. A prince for his own behalf. Okay, this is a military leader that is on the side of the Pope of Rome. It's a prince for his own behalf. You follow that? If this, is, if this is Julius Caesar illustrating modern Rome conquering Egypt, then what is Rome's, how does Rome exercise military power? Does it, USA or, yeah, that's the right answer, but I'm saying it never has its own army. Okay, it's always some other military entity that does its dirty work. And this is saying that a prince for his own behalf shall cause the repro reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. So there's a military leader that's working in conjunction with the Pope of Rome at this point in time. And there's some kind of reproach that the Pope of Rome has caused. And this military leader is going to bring it to a conclusion. So go to Dan Isaiah 2 verse 1. Keep your finger in Daniel 11. Isaiah 2, verse 1. We want to know what this reproach is. Because this military leader, he's going to bring the reproach to a conclusion. Verse 1 of Isaiah 2 says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Jerusalem and Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And all I want you to get out of there is that this is the last days, and that this vision continues on without any break, all the way in to chapter 4 of Isaiah. So chapter 4, verse 1, is the last days. It's during the time period when the church triumphant has already been raised up. The mountain of the Lord of hosts has been established above the mountains. And in chapter 4, verse 1, in this same vision, it says, And in that day, the last days, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. The reproach that's offered by the papacy is if you're not part of the ecumenical Catholic association that is put in place at that time period, then, then there's a reproach pronounced upon you. Okay, you're unacceptable. But if you go back to Daniel 11, verse 18, it says, But a prince for his own behalf shall cause the reproach offered by him. The Catholic Church is 
offering all the Christian churches, if you will come into unity with us, uh, your reproach will be removed, but there is a military leader that's going to turn this upside down. It says, without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Go to Revelation 17, verse 16. Knowing that... Well, don't, go to, don't go to 16 yet. Go to Revelation 16, verse 14. 17, 14. Revelation 17, verse 14. First. Okay. It says, These shall make war with the Lamb. Who's that? Who's going to make war? The ten kings. So what are they? They're military. Okay. This is the ten kings. This is the, the military branch of of the papacy at the end of the world. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lord and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now go to verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The military apparatus that the papacy is going to use at the end is going to turn on her and take her reproach away. Go back to Daniel 11 verse 18. It says, And after this he shall turn his face unto the isles and shall take many. Okay, he's already set his face to go to Egypt in the previous verse. So it means he's going to die. He's, he's, he's in his death march. But a prince of his own behalf that's the ten kings that have come into unity with him. Shall cause the reproach offered by him to cease. Without his own reproach, he shall cause it to turn upon him. Then he shall turn his face toward the fort of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and not be found. He shall come to his end with none to help. Verse 19 takes you all the way down to verse 45. Verse 18 is the ten kings burning her with fire and eating her flesh. Verse 17 is telling you that she's taken Egypt, but it means that her probation is almost over. Okay. The United Nations. The, the civil structure that the papacy uses. So it will turn against the papacy. Yes, that's standard understanding. The ten kings hate the whore and they eat her flesh and burn her with fire and you can go in and show those in other lines of prophecy that this is so. Then in verse 20 it says then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom but within few but within few days he shall be destroyed not in anger nor in battle. Who's that? That's Augustus, that's Obama, okay? <laughs> a raiser of taxes. That's Augustus. And it's typifying Obama. And it, who was the first Republican president? Abraham Lincoln. Okay, when did the Republican Party begin? Like in the 1830s, roughly. When did the Democratic Party begin? Like in the 1830s. Okay, but the Democratic Party becomes the Democratic Party. It comes out of another party. And that party is what we would call the Jacobean party, okay? And the Jacobeans, they had a name for them that escapes me, that political party's name. But it set that name aside and it became the Democratic Party. And so whether, whether we understand it or not, the roots of the Democratic Party, they go all the way back to the Jacobeanism, the communism of the French Revolution. Came right out of it, okay? So when you see... Bernie Sanders running for presidency and he's full-blown communist. That's not a new revelation. It's, it is the characteristic of the Democratic Party. And they've been in a struggle with the Republican Party for 150 years. But my point is this. There was never a Democratic president that got more accomplished towards the, the pursuit of socialism or communist ideas than Obama. Okay, he came in the glory of his kingdom, and his kingdom is communism, it's socialism. Never reached that height on their, you know, you might argue that uh, 
Franklin Roosevelt with all the socialistic programs he put in place, uh, he's no doubt the, the great granddaddy of them all. But what Obama did, uh, that's the glory of that kingdom. But it's all over. Because this, this here, he's the, the end of the presidents of the United States. And in verse 21, it says, And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. Who, who's they? Who's the vile person? It's going to be Trump. But they're not going to give him the honor of the kingdom. Is, is, is anyone cooperating with Trump at this current point in time? He's not getting the honor of the kingdom, is he? Even some of his Repu Republican... Uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're jumping ship. He's got a struggle right, right from the beginning. But we know that he's a vile guy. If you want to accept God's word, he's a vile person. Um, but the, what I want you to see in here, I'm not trying to badmouth the president. Okay. <laughs> he shall, the phrase in here, in verse 21, is he shall come in peaceably. This is perhaps the most important characteristic of Donald Trump, is that he comes in peaceably. And the reason for that is if you drop down to verse 24, it says, He shall enter peaceably. So you know from verse 21 and verse 24 that they're both talking about Donald Trump. Okay, but before you get to verse 24, we're going to put verse 23 at a certain place in this history so that you can see that it's dealing with Donald Trump because Donald Trump is the 45th president, and he comes in peaceably. You follow the logic there? In verse 21, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. It, and does prophecy sometimes portray truth with opposites? If you follow what I mean. Um, Jezebel wanted to arrest Elijah and kill him. Was Elijah arrested and killed? No, but he typified John the Baptist, who Herodias wanted to arrest and kill. Was John the Baptist arrested and killed? Yes. So sometimes prophecy uses opposites to convey a truth. Did Trump get elected because he flattered people? Just the opposite. Just the opposite. If you, he, what, what they call him, he's a good counterpuncher. You say something to Trump, he's going to tweet right back in your face. It wasn't flattery. It was just the opposite. Okay, so this can still be understood to be a characteristic of Trump, if you know prophetic symbolism. And with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, and he shall be broken, yea, also... The Prince of the Covenant. Okay, so who is this in typical prophetic history? This is Tiberius. And it's talking about the death of Tiberius and the death of who else? Jesus. Okay, so the cross is right here. Tiberius is typifying Trump. What's the cross typify? The Sunday Law. Okay, Trump is the 45th president. The, with, with these three, yet three kings shall stand up in Persia, and the four shall be far richer than they all are. You, you see the four presidents here in these verses because you have a starting point, the time of the end. The time of the end in the first year of Darius. Daniel 11.1, 1, the third year of Cyrus, Daniel 10.1, gives you a starting point to unravel who these three Persian kings are that are followed by Xerxes. But there's a second witness in Daniel 11, and it's the four Roman rulers. But you don't, you don't establish them as the presidents by a starting point. You, start, you establish them by the ending point. The ending point for Tiberius is the cross, which is the Sunday law, and it allows you to work backwards with these four Roman rulers, but that's the way the Lord works. Um, he's given a second witness, um, and he's tying it all together very nicely, but I want you to remember that Trump comes in peaceably. All right. If you look 
Daniel 11, verses 18 19, it describes the history past Trump. When Trump. Yes. Right. And then if you go to verse 20, it says then. So supposedly it should describe the history following verses 42 when there is a Sunday law uh, in place. But then why are we jumping back to Obama? Okay, good question. I'm, I mentioned it last night, but I just mentioned it. And, I, and even if some of you heard it last night, I'm not sure that it clicked on for everyone. Okay, but here, last night, how many of you weren't here last night? Raise your hand. Okay, so you didn't hear the logic. I mentioned it here again today, but you didn't see the logic that the midnight cry message of Samuel Snow was the opening of the seventh seal. And that the opening of the seventh seal is the end of the prophetic light of the Millerite history and Jesus illustrates the end with the beginning and the first thing that was unsealed is the judgment hour message by Miller and Samuel Snow the seventh seal is the perfection of that message therefore the first seal that was opened up for us is Daniel 11 40 to 45 okay and it gets brought to perfection here with this passage but as I was mentioning that last night I pointed out something that I will point out once again. In 1989, and for many years we didn't remember this, okay? But in 1989 we were studying with people on a regular basis. There'd be 10 to 15 people come over to our house and one of the people that came over to our house uh, fell in love with another person that came over to our house and they decided that they wanted to get married. And we had a really nice backyard with a bunch of fruit trees and grapes and, and lawn. So they wanted to get married in our backyard. So they did. So about 2006, 2007, this brother who had got married in our backyard, he was at a meeting in California because that's where this took place. And I, and I just said, hey, Tony, when was it that you and Michelle got married? Because he would remember. He says, 1989. So because we knew we were studying, we had the confirmation of their marriage taking place in 1989, we knew what we were studying back then. And what we began to study in that time period was the reform lines. The line upon lines began to be understood in 1989. Okay? And then in 1991, what gets opened up is the last six verses of Daniel 11. So what I was saying last night is you can't separate these two elements. The line upon line in Daniel 11 is the message that was opened up at the time of the end in 1989. So what we're seeing here in Daniel 11, this is a line. This is a line. This is a line. This is a line. These lines in this chapter are part of the line upon line. So you are right. If you're relating to Julius Caesar, as I have been, Finishing the conquering of the third horn of Egypt as typified in Daniel 11 40 through 43 Then when you get to verse 19 he's come to his end with none to help But you can also go back up in here and show that in verse 16 That this is Pompey the first of these four Roman rulers and you can begin in verse 16 with Pompey coming and desecrating the temple, and then Julius Caesar, and then Augustus and the Tiberius, and there's a line in there. And it's our responsibility to rightly divide the word of truth. So this, this vision is the climax of the prophetic visions in God's word. This is a, a masterpiece of divine thought, and there are many lines in here that we haven't recognized, I'm positive of it. So you're asking the correct question. Why am I breaking verse 19 from verse 20? It's because based upon the context, I can see a line there that's illustrating the final fall of modern Rome. But I have the prophetic license to also go back into previous verses and address these four Roman rulers as the last four presidents of the United States. And my argument is, is that's what the message is. It's about bringing the perfection of the last six verses of Daniel 11 together, but it does so by employing line upon line. I hope that answers your thought. We can trace instead of Julius Caesar, we can put uh, 
Pompeii in Peter. And Pompeii is verse 16. Yes. It's Pompeii in verse 16, then Julius Caesar up through verse 19, and then verse 20, is it? Is Augustus? And Tiberius is 21 and 22. But that's a different line. That's four rulers. Everyone understand that? When am I supposed to quit, my brother? Pardon me? I'm supposed to quit at 12? And it's only 11.30, is that clock right? Okay. Um, all right, so. Verse 23. And let's. You notice on verse 7, I have the battle of. Uh, on, on page 7 of your notes, I have Paneum. I'm passing over that. Okay, we're going to come back to that, Lord willing, and we're going to look at how Paneum also opens up the light on the Omega Apostasy. But we're going to just stick with the, the prophetic history first. So I'm going to jump ahead to verse 23, and uh, that's on page 11. Now, I'm going to tell, uh, some of you that have watched the School of the Prophets probably know this story, but... I'm going to put this in the record here as well. At the beginning, I think about the 19th or something of December, some 17th, 19th, I forget when I went to Wells. It was the middle of December, right? Yeah, and you got there after me. So the middle of December, I went to Wells, and we had two days where we were going to discuss some stuff on organization you know, with the various groups around the world. And then we had Sabbath. And on Sabbath, uh, Brother Tabo from Canada was there in the organizational meeting. And he and I shared speaking on Sabbath Friday night and throughout the day of Sabbath. And at, when the sun went down on Sabbath, uh, then we went over to Brother Chawatu's house. And he shared this information that we've been covering here on these verses. All right. And, and when he got done, we, we went over there when the sun went down and it goes down early in December in Wales. So we were over there fairly early in the evening and, and I know we didn't leave till well after midnight. And when he got done sharing, I, I asked him, I said, do you have any ownership on this? Are you going to be offended if, if I go out and share this before you do publicly? And, and if he would have said, yeah, I'd like to be the first one to share it publicly, I would have let him because some people worry about that. But he didn't. He said, go ahead. Because I knew I was going to Holland that very next week and what I heard, and I've got rebuked for saying this, uh, what I heard, I could tell it was the same, same sound that I was so familiar with personally in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Okay. That is not any proof text message of what is truth. That's why I get rebuked. Oh, I'm just going with my feelings. All right. But in any case, I could tell that this message was sound. And so I asked him if he's going to mind if when I go to Holland, if I change what I was supposed to present into this. And he said, no, go ahead and do it. He was going to do it the very next week. Um, so that happened on that Sabbath. And then on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, then there were some presentations made that opened up the idea that this movement is now in its final uh, shaking, the final apostasy, which Sister White it calls the Omega apostasy. And that began to open up. So what I'm saying is, in that week-long period, Daniel 11 began to open up. Um, the Omega apostasy began to open up. Um, and then, when we went to Holland, the group of us, Parminder and Tabo went to Africa. Okay, And in Africa, we began to see that, sure enough, there is now... Uh, there's another movement that's come out of this movement. All right. Now, I'll leave it up to everyone to decide whether both of those movements are counterfeits or maybe one of them is a counterfeit and the other one's a genuine and you can decide which one's the genuine and which is the counterfeit or maybe they're both counterfeits. But that's what happened in a short period of time and when it first started awakening to me in Wales, I said, no way, we're so close to midnight to close the probation, there's not a possibility that there can be another movement come out of this movement. By the, but the, by the time Tabo and Parminder got to Africa, it was already happening. 
So when Tabo was there, and I'm not sure he's even home from Africa, um, he and five other Africans from at least three other African countries that had come together for some camp meetings, they're the ones the Lord used to put this information together that we're going to take up from verse 23 onward. Okay, And it also is some very sound information. So what I'm saying is, in the last month and a half, Daniel 11 is opening up, confirming what we understood about Daniel 11, 40 to 45 from the beginning of this movement, but, but turning a light on this history like we've never seen. It's bringing Russia into the mix, okay? And uh, right at the time where you can see Russia in the mix in the, in the history of the world, it's in its agreement with what's happening in history. And... Uh, I guess that's all I need to say about that. So where they begin their, their presentation is in verse 23. And I had been telling, I've told my wife several times that if there was a, if there was, if there's a verse in Daniel 11 that prevents me from wrapping my mind around what it represents, it's this particular verse. Where are you going to apply the League of the Jews and what does it represent? Okay. So, um, verse 23 says this. And after the lead, league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with the small people. Now, the league of the Jews I hope this isn't too important for any of you. The league of the Jews if you go into Uriah Smith, he's going to say, when was the League of the Jews? He's going to say 161. But if you're really zealous for this chart, when are you going to say? 158. Right over here. Time of the League between the Jews and the Romans, 158 years before Christ. It quotes Maccabees, Daniel 11:23. And after the league with him, he shall work deceitfully. There's your key that I never understood until here recently. I wondered why Uriah Smith didn't hold the pioneer position of 158. But it was pointed out to me here recently that the pioneers had a specific understanding of this. And when you see the understanding, then it makes sense why they're in agreement. Back in the verse it says, and after the league. So what that, what's that telling you? That the league is made, and after the league is made, Rome is going to work deceitfully. So the pioneer logic was, is that the, that the Jews came into a league, a contract, uh, a treaty with Rome, because they needed help. They were under pressure from the Syrians. But it was, it was a death warrant for the Jews. They didn't realize it, that when you enter into a, a, a contract with Rome, that at some point in time, Rome's going to turn against you. And the pioneers acknowledge this and say that it's in 158 when Rome began to act deceitfully. So they're marking 158, the pioneers, as when the treaty that the, had been formed with the Jews is finally being used against the Jews. And by the time Christ comes on the scene, um, you know, 150 some years later, 180 if you want to count, 20s, 30 years old, the Romans are, I, the Romans are picking who's going to be the high priest and who's going to be the governor of, of the Jews, okay? Because of this treaty, they put themselves in a position where all their national sovereignty is gone and they don't even have control over who's the head of their church, okay? The pioneers will tell you the deceitfulness of it began in 158. So, there is a some kind of league that is some kind of arrangement that's going to take place between the Jews and Rome at the end of the world. Who's who's Rome at the end of the world? Oh, you can say the papacy, but but I'm looking for the United States. Okay, and who's the Jews? Seventh Day Adventist Church. Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, because of this crisis of raffia, 
okay? Whatever happens with the United States getting defeated um, right here, peace treaty signed very quickly, but remember, the king of the south, he returns to Egypt and he accomplishes a persecution against the Sabbath keepers in Russia. And even including putting a mark on them. So when, when this war here of Rafia comes to pass, it's going to create some kind of response in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the United States, evidently based upon what's being carried out in Asia, in, in Russia. All right? So we have here the characteristics that we've already identified about midnight. And what we've already identified from other studies about midnight is that there's going to be faithful priests at midnight that are going to get persecuted. And they're going to get persecuted by a threefold union. Okay, that threefold union is made up of the false priests, the false, the foolish virgins, the false priests. Seventh-day Adventist church structure, they're going to come together. This is Judas. One of the twelve that separates here at midnight. He's, they're going to come in connection with the Seventh-day Adventist church, and Seventh-day Adventist church and Judas are going to make an arrangement with the government of the USA. For what purpose? To arrest Christ right here to arrest the, the 11 wise priests. Okay, so you have the Seventh-day Adventist Church here forming a league. Some kind of legal agreement with the United States government right here at midnight. Okay, and now th this is a threefold union. This is a threefold union. And the rule in the Bible is, is with what judgment you measure, it shall be measured unto you. Okay. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church at midnight, it's going to reach out to the government of the United States to place persecution upon the faithful. But right over here, Rome is going to act deceitfully against those Seventh-day Adventists because this is the end of the Seventh-day Adventist Church structure. Why is that? This is where the church triumphant is fully developed, but why is it the end of the Seventh-day Adventist church structure? First Sunday law. You have your first Sunday law here. And what makes you part of Babylon, brothers and sisters, according to the spirit of prophecy, there are two great errors of Babylon that you have to accept if you're going to be part of Babylon. What are those two great errors? Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. Okay, back here, back here, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has already disconnected itself from righteousness. It's reached out to the government of the United States to persecute faithful priests. Okay, therefore, it's under strong delusion. And strong delusion is the spiritualism that is represented by the state of the dead. Okay, so they, they're buying into the strong delusion right here, but they're also going to accept the Sunday law right here. It may not be a Sunday law where you're persecuted for keeping Sabbath. You may still be able to observe Sabbath and observe Sunday. But because of the crisis in the world, they're going to agree that what's needed at this time is some kind of Sunday legislation to take control of the, the circumstances. And they're going to buy into Sunday sacredness and be receiving the strong delusion, which is the spiritualism of the immortality of the soul. They're totally disconnected here. The, it's all over fully here but this is where the church triumphant's coming in this is Jerusalem being lifted up and this is Jerusalem going down okay and it it starts back here with this League of the Jews so the way the brethren in Africa did this is they took these verses and then they took Uriah Smith's comments from Thoughts on Daniel Revelation, they took a couple comments from A.T. Jones. And they call that the type. So they, they read the verse. We just read verse 23. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. And then on page 11 of your notes, you can see the quote from Uriah Smith. 
Below the, Smith, the quote from Uri Smith, they kind of summarize the quote, and then they give you the anti-type. They're going to read out how they think that this applies in our day and age. Okay, and uh, verse 24 says this, and, and we're going to go through this, but we're going to go through it after lunch. I'm going to put a couple things in place, pardon me? We're on page 11 of your notes. You don't have to worry about page 11 of your notes. We're going to come to back to this after lunch. I'm going to just share some things with you now to give you an overview of what the rest of this study represents. Okay. In verse 24, after the leagues made with the Jews and after the, the government is starting to work deceitfully because when you get to here, it's not going to be the Adventist church that's leading out in the persecution. It's going to be the Protestant churches that are leading out at this way mark. And they're going to be insisting that the Seventh-day Adventist church accepts Sunday because they're going to get the same judgment that they measured back here. Okay, that this is the, so they're going to enter into a league here, but it's going to become deceitful for them here. It's going to, the consequences of it is going to take place here. So in verse 24 it says, He shall enter peacefully upon the fattest places of the province. Who is that? That's got to be Trump. Why has it got to be Trump? Go back up to verse 21. Yes, in verse 21... It says, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person. This is Tiberius. And Tiberius is to find this president, Trump. Okay, but when it's speaking about him in verse 21, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. The characteristic of Trump is that he comes in peaceably. The League of the Jews is at midnight. That's verse 23. And then in verse 24 it says... He shall enter even upon, he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province. This has got to be the 45th president of the United States. Okay, he's in this history. What's he doing? He's entering it on the fattest places of the provinces. Okay, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. Trump is not going to take control of the world through warfare. He's going to take control of the world through treaties. He's going to tell Mexico, you don't think you're going to pay for that wall, but I'm going to show you that if you pay for that wall, I'm going to make you more wealthy than you would have been if you wouldn't have been being so ridiculous about relating to me that way. Because that's what Rome did. That's how Rome took control of the world, is through treaties. That's what they did with the League, with the Jews. And he's going to go out. He's famous for the what? The art of the what? The deal. Okay. And he's already started this treaty making. And that's what Rome did in this verse. And that's how the pioneers understand it. Is that Rome took the world through treaties. Okay. So he's going to do that which his fathers have not done nor his father's fathers. He shall, he shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. He's going to say, I'll make you rich too, but America first. You let America get rich and I'll bring you along in the wake. Okay. And he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds, even for a time. Okay, so what I'm saying is, what they're saying, is that the time is 360 years. And we typically mark that from 31 BC to 330. And the time... is from the midnight cry to the Sunday law. Okay? This here is not only the battle of Paneum. This is the battle of Actium also. Okay, now, so you, so you get my point. Some of you will understand something already. You may not understand why I'm making this claim, but you will understand a prophetic truth already, and when I give you that prophetic truth, you'll get it. It's easy to see. What's the time? 360. 360. Okay, this history here, from the midnight cry to the Sunday law, we understand to be the image of the beast test. Right? Do we see the image of the beast test in Daniel chapter 3? 
Yes. yes. How big was that image? It was 6 times 60. Right? Wasn't it? And what's 6 times 60? It's 360. Just to add uh, to that dimension, I've, I've learned from some studies that in the Jewish mind, when you give two dimensions that are the same, the third one is automatically applied, so it actually is 666. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. But even at this level, you can see the 360. What is this image? But what's the symbol? The, 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 the beast is the papacy. And the papacy operates through the combination of church and state. But what is the, the primary symbol of uh, the Catholic religion? Let's say it that way. Yeah, well, Sunday. The sun. Like, is, it, is it typical to see in uh, Catholic um, artwork these various symbols of the sun? How many degrees are there in that circle? 360. 360. Okay, this is the image of the beast test that begins at the Battle of Actium, which is also the Battle of Paneum. And it goes to here until the mark of the beast test begins here. So what I'm saying is the, the brethren in Africa have put in place these following verses, and they're going to put the Battle of Actium here, and it's sound. And what happens over here? If this is the Battle of Actium here, what's here? What, did, what happened at the end of those 360 years? <laughs> Wait, 330, the kingdom is divided, okay, between east and west. This is, this is the end of the United States, okay? Constantine's now moved the capital to the eastern side of the empire, and the, the kingdom begins to crumble through the trumpets that are coming. Okay, so this would be 330. This would be... Now, you know, I, just recently, I've learned something. Maybe all of you already knew this. I didn't. I used to know that... I, I know the Battle of Actium was when? 31 B.C. And I always knew that when I said that, I always wondered why people, they always let me get away with it. I'd say that in the year 330, Constantine moved the capital to Constantinople. And it was 360 years. And I guess everyone's figuring the year zero, so they let me get away with 361 years. Right? Do you see that discrepancy? But now I know what the discrepancy is. Do you know what the discrepancy is? And it's important to see, is that Egypt wasn't fully, the rebellion in Egypt was not fully done until the year 30. The Battle of Actium was in 31 BC, but the, the subduing of the rebellion of Cleopatra and Anthony isn't finished until 30. And actually, the decree by Constantine to change the capital from Rome to Constantinople was 329. And the process of moving it was 330. So there is a, there's a one-year there's a one-year process in this history. And if you look closely at the pioneers, they acknowledge that. I never looked closely at it, but I have now. And what it means, what, what the brethren in Africa are going to point out as we go through, is that before this Battle of Actium, both Mark Antony and Octavius Caesar, who's going to fight with him, they're building up their military in advance of that battle. There'll be another line here that Trump and Russia are building up their military before this battle. There's going to be an economic boom that leads to this battle. I I'm assuming that you have an economic boom when you're spending money on building warships and planes and that kind of stuff. Okay, so the, it's not a singular date is what I'm saying, the Battle of Actium and the... the, the moving of the kingdom, the capital to the other side of the kingdom. But this is the end of the United States, it's been divided, okay? So then the brethren are gonna show us how verses 25 through 29 repeat and enlarge upon this history. And it talks about, in, in one place, it'd be in this history, where they both speak lies at one table, 
Okay, this is Putin and Trump. Okay, they're both building up their military, getting ready for this battle. But they're speaking lies. It's, they're, they're deceitful. And that's about to happen here. Okay, so it's amazing to me how quickly, this is six weeks from different places around the world where this chapter has opened up and how incredibly airtight it is. And that's sort of how Samuel Snow's message want, went once it got started. Um, I would even argue that the fact that there's obviously more people in this meeting than there's ever been in any other meeting, I'm, under, I'm believing now that these meetings for the first time are gonna start growing because of this message, okay? We're here. And the history that's going on outside of here is speaking to this 100%. And all the little, the, the little details, I gotta throw this one in, out, I did it already last night, but it just blows my mind. What has been opened up is that Russia is the king of the south and it's about to get into two warfares with the United States. It's gonna win the first one, lose the second one. This gets opened up right when you can see the troubles between Russia and the United States. How could it possibly be that the President of the United States name means ruler of the world and the President of Russia, Vladimir, means ruler of the world? Both of these leaders, their names providentially, are saying that this is the battle over planet Earth that takes place here that leads to Armageddon. There's those kind of little nuances that are coming up all over the place about this history that just blows your mind. So I'll pray and I'll pray for the food at the same time. Yeah. Shall we pray? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we are amazed that we've been privileged to live at this point in history and actually be seeing some of these wonderful truths that you're opening up at this time. But they're, they're very frightening, Lord. Frightening for us as individuals, but even more so for our consideration of where our family and our loved ones are at at this time, where our church members are at at this time. Lord, we ask that this message would work a transformation in our minds and our hearts that we might be fit vessels that you can use as a tool in your hands to awaken our loved ones and our friends to the need of preparation and the urgency of how rapidly these things are happening. We thank you that you've given us opportunity on this third Sabbath since the 45th president has begun his, his uh, time to lead the world to Armageddon, that we might come together and study these things and be awakened. As we break now and partake of some physical food, we ask that you would bless that for the nourishment of our bodies, that uh, you would also bless the hands that have prepared it, and that you would help us keep our conversations as we partake of the physical food in agreement with the, the sacred hours of Sabbath and the sacredness of the message that we're considering. And we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.